so thanks, Justin, for for a very nice set of uh, lectures where, where I you clarified many of the confusions I had about how you guys calculate these things uh, purely classically and definitely give, give us a lot to think about. Um, so let me summarize what we uh, what we did yesterday. Um, and, and I will tell you then what we are going to do today. So yesterday, we the basic goal was to go from the quantum amplitude to the classical amplitude. So I just explained how to perform this so-called soft expansion, this expansion in small q. And, and we identified that inside of the scattering amplitude, there are, there are corrections that go like GMQ to the, to the loop order. And basically, these corrections um, encode the, the PM expansion. The, the, the post Minkowskian expansion. In fact, the, the, the L loop amplitude was the L plus one PM correction to something that that is some classical quantity that today we'll be talking about more. Also, we, we talked about velocity counting, why it's useful to distinguish between things that naively look classical, but they're actually quantum. And also to, to tag certain contributions, because in addition to these pieces in the amplitude that they're, they're the ones that we are ultimately interested in, there's other contributions that have a different dependence on Q, um, um, and, and then they have also some uh, inverse powers of velocity. So contributions that blow up at, at slow velocities, uh, which we call iteration or super classical or classically singular. And, and these things clearly won't feature in, in, in most um, classical observables that we will compute. Um, and, and the, the origin of those, the intuition was that the amplitude is really more like an exponential of, of some object, which is the one that has a, a well-defined classical expansion, well-defined post-Newtonian expansion. But one, one expands that exponential, then one gets not only like a given PM correction like this, but also its powers that will look more like this. And one of the goals today will be to make that, that more precise and turn it into something that we can use to, to calculate in particular, we will be trying to calculate this exponent directly. So just as examples, uh, so that you re refresh your mind. Uh, so the tree amplitude was just this kind of a chain diagram, and this went simply as gm to the fourth over q squared, and um, and then the p n counting was always relative to the tree. So at one loop, we have diagrams that look like a box, which are these kind of iterations where we have two like iterated exchanges that look like tree level. So those, the dependence was as follows. We worked out some integral. Um, so there's the GM to the fourth over Q squared. There's something which doesn't have any powers of Q, the inverse power of velocity. And then there's something, some integral that here I just multiply and divided by Q squared. But um, the important thing is that it still has this, this uh, denominator here, this LZ. Um, and uh, which is tied to this, this inverse power of velocity. And similarly, uh, um, the triangle has a, a, has a very similar structure, except that it actually has the power that we want, GMQ. Uh, so, so this will encode the, the 2 p.m. correction to something. And, um, and then the integral that, that goes with it doesn't have that LZ, so it doesn't have that the inverse power of velocity. So I didn't tell you how, to integrate more generally at high orders, but uh, I hope you'll believe me if I tell you that the, the structure of the amplitude is gonna look something like this. So there's always gonna be deep, deep in the Q expansion, there's gonna be this, this post minkowskian correction that we're interested in. So all of this is multiplied by functions of velocity and masses that I'm suppressing. Um, but in addition, there's gonna be pieces that look like the generalization of this box integral. And they always look something like like lower powers of GMQ, there's some inverse powers of velocity, um, and there's an integral that still has this uh, this um, LZ, so the, the loop momenta. So all of these are three-dimensional integrals, and and it still has this this um, one over L in the in the Z direction for for each one of the loops. Okay, so it turns out that we can reduce all our integrals or our relativistic integrals to some function of velocity multiplying things that look like this. Okay. So any questions about that, which we discussed yesterday? That's the last, last thing because we didn't have time. Okay, so what are we gonna do today? 
um, I, I drew this picture where I said, okay, if I gave you the amplitude, the classical amplitude, then there's two ways to proceed. One is to try to determine some, some observables directly. So I call this the on-shell way, where I just, from the amplitude, I try to extract some physical quantity. And there's also what I call the off-shell way, which also using the amplitude, which is an off-shell object, we could try to extract uh, off-shell quantities like Hamiltonian, a stress tensor, things that depend on coordinates that are not gauge invariant, but that then we can use to, to calculate the dynamics. So today we're gonna to explain how to do this. So uh, before the break, I will explain how to go from the classical amplitude in the, for the conservative case. So we will focus on, on the conservative dynamics. to a two-body Hamiltonian that then we can use to calculate observables. Um, and then after the break, we'll, we'll explain how to go directly from the amplitude to gauge invariant observables without going through some off-shell quantity, uh, like a Hamiltonian, which is again, non, not gauge invariant. So this approach has an advantage, uh, at least naively, that, that I can, once I have this Hamiltonian, I can use it to solve also for the in-spiraling dynamics, not only for the scattering dynamics, which is what is naturally tied to the scattering amplitude. Um, as it turns out, as, as Justin said, and as I'm sure we'll hear from Raphael and others next week in the conference, it, it also works the other way around. Like one can just focus on the scattering dynamics, calculate observables there, and then connect that directly um, to, to a Hamiltonian, extract the Hamiltonian uniquely from this observable, um, or, um, well, not uniquely because it depends on coordinates, but except a Hamiltonian from these observables. Or alternatively, we can go from the scattering observables to the, to the in-spiraling observables directly. Okay, so I, I won't be talking about that last step, but let's just do this. Um, so what is the basic intuition? So, so the way we are gonna do this is using uh, a non-relativistic EFT. So I, I'll call it uh, non-relativistic because it will have some funny kinetic term, but we will we'll be keeping all orders in velocity. So what is the intuition? So we have our full theory. Which has this uh, scalar field that denote our matter. And there's also gravitons of different kinds. So there's like potential gravitons, there's radiation gravitons. Um, so remember that these ones, their velocity scaling went like V the energy component, and this went like one. So the energy component was much smaller. And radiation, they both went like V. And, and then what I could do is to integrate out this potential graviton to get to an EFT, which only has the scalars. And it could also have the radiation gravitons because these are on shell, so these we cannot integrate out. But today we, we won't be talking about this. So we'll, we'll just talking about how if we consider the scalars interacting with potential gravitons, we can integrate these out um, to generate um, some, some interactions between the scalars that don't depend on this. So this will be the scalars and some potential that tell us how, how, these, things, um, how these things interact. And the, the basic idea is that if I have this kind of diagram, then I'm just zooming out and then I will replace this by a vertex, which is a potential. Now, because this is a massless particle, this potential will be non-local, but uh, still I can, I don't, I don't need to describe it as, a, as a, the exchange of a particle. I can just describe it as a, as a non-local potential. Okay, so what are the advantages of this kind of approach? Um, and, and what is the, how, how are we gonna use this? Um, so the important thing is that the EFT focuses, so this is some general thing about EFTs, not, not only in this particular case, but um, focuses on the relevant degrees of freedom. And also very importantly, both the full theory And the EFT describe the same physics at low energies. Okay. 
low energies, I mean long distances in this case. And um, so this is important. So, so we are not losing anything. When we do this calculation, we could do it in the EFT if we have the relevant description and we could do it in the full theory and we will be describing the same thing. And this leads to the idea of matching. So this is slightly different matching from the one that, like, yeah, from the one that Justin was, was talking about. Um, so this is a matching in the EFT. And matching just means that, okay, if the, if the dynamics is gonna be described by this effective theory um, that we're gonna write down in a second, um, then let's just calculate some quantity in using the EFT. Let's calculate the same quantity in the full theory. Um, and then let's just require that they're equal. So in our case, that will mean that, uh, that the amplitude in the EFT has to be equal to the amplitude in the full theory. And we will use this to determine like uh, for instance, the coefficients in our potential in the EFT. So I'll, I'll explain how that works. Okay, so any, any questions about the basic idea that we're gonna try to come out in more detail? It's okay, so just to set up the stage. So it's convenient to write this effective theory directly in the center of mass frame. One can write it more generally, but it's a bit more cumbersome. So let me just uh, set up this because also it will be useful to calculate some classical stuff later. Momentum sometimes. So this is just kind of undergrad physics. So we have our amplitude, P1, P2, P3, P4. In the center of mass frame, uh, we have the, the total momentum, which is like P1 plus P2, minus P1 minus P2, because I have all a going convention. This thing is just gonna be like the total energy at zero. Um, so we can parameterize P1, as energy one, uh, P, P4, energy one, P5. Okay, and then some, some things. Some quantities that we'll be using. So this momentum transfer now, because remember it was uh, P1 plus P4. Um, um, so this is gonna be purely transverse. And this is gonna be a Q vector, which is P prime minus P. And I already defined the, the total energy. In particular, this implies that our ski squared from below, from before, this is going to be the same as a Q vector squared. Okay, so this is very easy. And now we can write uh, our EFT for the conservative dynamics. So what are the properties that we want this EFT to have? So we don't want any particle production. This means that we shouldn't have any multi-point vertices. Like every vertex should have as many particles coming in as particles coming out. And in particular, because we are only interested in two to two scattering for the two body problem, we will just worry about the four point vertex. And also, it shouldn't have, uh, it should have only matter. Um, but uh, by this, I mean no antimatter. Okay, so we, we only have, um, um, we, we only have matter with the, with the potential gravitons integrated, integrated out. Uh, the Lagrangian for this kind of EFT is gonna look something like this. I will write it directly in momentum space just for convenience. Um, 
By the way, uh, this EFT is, was written in this paper. So this is the only reference I'm going to give. So it's a paper by uh, Cliff Chung, Michael Salon, and I Rossin. And many of the things that we're talking in this part, you can find also spelled out there. It's a very nice and short paper, very easy to understand. I recommend you to take a look. Um, so the Lagrangian looks something like this. So this is a sum over the two particles. This is the funny kinetic term that I told you. So it's non-relativistic because it has this, this, this square root, but as you see, this would imply some relativistic dispersion relation. So secretly we, we are encoding still all the, all the velocity corrections. And then there's our four point interaction. So this is like all the complicated dynamics that we had of gravity interacting with this matter will be reduced to this very simple theory where we just have two scalar fields with this funny kinetic term interacting through a potential. This potential will depend, will depend on their momentum. So what is the form of this kind of potential? Uh, so this is going to have some expansion that looks like this. So remember, Q was the difference between these momenta. So it's going to have some like Q squared, and then like some zero to infinity. There's going to be some coefficients that we don't know. That depend on on basically p squared and p prime squared. And then there's going to be our like G Q to the L that encodes the post minkowskian corrections. So I'm just suppressing powers of the mass. I'm just putting all the powers of the mass in the coefficients. But it's the same story as the amplitude. Remember, the amplitude had this G over Q squared, and then it had all of these corrections. And in particular, if I if I fully transform this, um, if you Q R, let me write this as P. Uh, Q it's Q, it's Q. Um, this thing is going to have a very familiar form. So this is just going to look like, so there's these coefficients which are undetermined. And then there's just GM over R to some power. So this is just like the first term is clearly Newton. And then there's corrections that go like GM over R, which as I told you right at the beginning are the post minkowskian corrections. And our, our goal will be to determine these coefficients using our full theory amplitude that we explained how to compute yesterday. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so I think this is quite simple so far. Uh, so what are the Feynman rules in this theory? So this theory is so simple that it's not worth using any like fancy methods to compute the amplitude. As we will see, the amplitude takes a very simple form. So let's just use Feynman rules. So the propagator, if I have like momenta omega L, this is just gonna be so this is some matter propagator. So by one, by one, say it's going to be I over um, omega minus square root of L squared plus N one squared. So that's one rule. And the other one is I have a four point vertex, uh, which is just going to be minus I V P prime. And here I have like by one, 
two, like two. This was so. Uh, using a convention. So it's very simple. Now we can compute the amplitude at least as a, as a formal, you know, in a formal way to all orders. What does the EFT amplitude look like? So the EFT amplitude is just going to look like a sum over bubbles. So infinity, and then it's something that looks like this. We have like one minus two loops, and then each vertex here. So this is one, two, three, four. And each vertex here is just an insertion of this potential that we had before. So as you see, this, this is very clearly conservative because we only have two particle intermediate states at any stage in the process. I cannot cut this open in any way where there's more than two particles, and, and that's what we mean by conservative. Um, so this looks a bit funny, so let's try to put it in a more familiar form um, that many of you will recognize. Okay, so let's focus just on one of these loops. So what this what, what do the momenta of these legs look like? So this one is gonna have just some energy and some momentum. And then here we're gonna have the total energy that is incoming kind of the energy and then the opposite momentum because we're always in the center of mass frame. Um, so this, okay, so there's some insertions of potentials too. Um, so schematically, this looks like D3 of this K and there's the potential that depends on P and K. It was the, again, the incoming momentum, which uh, you can you can just read up at any stage. Here, there's always the same incoming momentum because of uh, spatial momentum conservation. Um, and then there's the interesting part. So what is the what is the interesting part? So there's some um, the omega. So these are these are the funny propagators. There's omega k squared plus m squared. So all the k's here are, are three momenta. Okay, so I, I should put in the i epsilons, but uh, just so that you see what's really going on. Okay, so nothing else depends on the energy of these legs. So we can automatically do this, this energy integral. And, and it's very easy to do because uh, there's only for each one of these loops, there's only these two poles. And here we have omega, here we have minus omega. Um, so we can just close the contour above or below. Uh, so this goes like one over omega squared and infinity. So it's, it's perfectly fine to, to close the contour. And when you do that, you get something which is familiar. So when you do that, um, what you get is, um, so let me let me ignore this integral. Uh, let me just write this energy part. Um, okay, maybe, maybe let me just write the whole thing. 
so that we don't get confused. Okay, so we get this propagator that looks like one over the energy minus something that looks again like an energy. So you can recognize this if the amplitude as something very familiar. So this if the amplitude is just the usual amplitude that you would compute in solving Schrodinger's equation perturbatively in old fashioned perturbation theory. What do I mean by this? So this if the amplitude is going to look something like I have like first term, which is a, an insertion of the potential. And then, so that this is just this, this kind of diagram. And then when I have one loop, I will have one of these propagators. So one loop is gonna look like V, one over the energy minus the free two body Hamiltonian. So the free two body Hamiltonian is just this thing, the sum over the kinetic terms. Then another insertion of V, so this is this diagram. Dot, 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 where you just have more insertions of V and, and more insertions of, of this uh, kind of two body propagator. Okay, so this is expected because everything we are doing here is just quantum mechanics with, with a potential. Okay, any questions? Okay, so we are almost there. We just need to do one last step so that we can recognize the form of the amplitudes that we had originally. Because the amplitudes we wrote in the full theory, they didn't have this funny two-body propagator. They had just some spatial propagators. But that's not a problem because both in the EFT and in the full theory, we still have Q as a, as a small parameter. Um, so in fact, in order to compare, we just need to, well, let me define, by the way, this, this whole thing that we have here, this thing here, let me define as omega PK, like delta PK. And then this integral that we have here, uh, let's actually switch variables to some L, which is just K plus uh, minus P. So here we will have now P plus L. So this L will be actually the momentum transfer because where before we were, we were using the momentum of these legs, the three momentum of this leg, but rather what we want is the difference between the incoming one and the outgoing one, which is the momentum transfer that happened in this vertex. Um, okay, so we have this, and um, and then we had like delta P plus L. Uh, but actually, one can just expand this for small l because remember, like our momentum exchanges were always the the, the smallest quantity. Um, and then this will look much more familiar. In fact, this thing after we expand, so the potential again will have some coefficient that looks like this with some power of G. Um, and then the integral that we have left over is an integral that looks like D3L, um, one over L, um, And then a propagator that looks like p dot l. So it's the same kind of linearized propagator that we were obtaining. So in, in the in the right coordinates where p is, is purely in the z direction, this is literally basically one over mass velocity times one over l z. And just going back to the beginning or to yesterday, this is precisely the form that uh, well here here I'm. I'm ignoring that there will be other 
the insertions of this potential. So in addition to this power, there will be like several powers. But if you look at this general form that I told you here, where I had these three dimensional integrals with L to some power, LZ, L2 to some power, L1 plus L2, Z, et cetera, et cetera. Then we recognize that, that uh, these kind of loop diagrams that we were computing here, they encode these, these iterations or these super classical pieces, these pieces that were singular in velocity. Um, and, and then the pure contact term, the diagram in the EFT, which doesn't have any integrals. So this is the, the diagram that looks like this. So at any order, uh, say at L order, we will have like the L piece, the piece that goes like V to the L of this guy. And then we will have loops that look like V L minus one, V one, but dot, dot, dot. Then we recognize all of these loops as these iterations that went like one over velocity that we, we talked about yesterday. So the last step to obtain the Hamiltonian is to try to solve for these C, CL coefficients. And uh, actually I never wrote the full theory amplitude, but let me, let me write it for the first time. So the full theory amplitude at three level, including all of the factors up to twos and minus signs, something like gm1 squared is two squared the q squared two sigma square minus one where sigma is uh q1 dot p2 over m1 m2 so this is kind of a, a Lorentz factor um and then the three like the uh three amplitude in the eft just looks like GC1 over Q squared, which comes from this diagram where I have here just V1. And then from this, I can just read off that C1 equals uh, M1 squared and two squared, two sigma squared minus one. And then I could just do this at each order so if I'm uh, if I can calculate the full theory amplitude, then the calculation of this EFT amplitude is very simple because I don't even need to calculate all of the integrals. I, I just need to put them into this standard form, and then um, all of these pieces here should cancel. And in fact, that is a very strong check of our calculation because it turns out that these amplitudes are infrared divergent, which is something I didn't mention before. But all the infrared divergences are contained in these integrals, and a, and a general consistency condition in a, in an effective theory that if you have infrared divergences, because these are a low energy effect, they should match in the infrared theory and the full theory. So the fact that all of these pieces will cancel in the matching is a, is a very non-trivial um, is a very non-trivial uh, check of their calculation or calculation. Um, so just for, for illustration, let me also do the one we more thematically. So the one loop amplitude in the full theory looks something like this, G from one squared, two squared over Q squared, G M1 and two Q five sigma squared, one and then there's so this came from, from triangle integrals and then there was gm1 and two squared over velocity um and here we have uh sorry two squared and one q sigma squared minus one um Word, and then this D3L, one over L, L minus Q, LZ. And the EFT amplitude takes a very similar form. So this, this is a bit more messy, so I won't write in, in its full glory. Um, Q 
but the schematic structure is the same. So we have a discord term for like a function of C1 and C2, and also derivatives of C1 over Q. Um, so this we can compare to this piece here, and then it has another piece which goes like D squared and some other function of, sorry. Uh, yeah. So there's some function of C1 squared and derivatives of this. that I'm not writing times this integral. Well, actually it's the same integral that we have here. And once again, if I just set these two equal, then I can just take these functions of the coefficients of my potential, which were undetermined, and just require that they're equal to, to this function that we computed in the full theory. And again, a non-trivial consistency check is that that these terms here should cancel. So you can see that these terms go roughly like, like C1 squared as expected, but, but um, this is, this is a, usually a check in your calculation. And then from this piece here, which remember we were saying that the things that go like GMQ are the things that actually encode the post-Minkowskian dynamics, then that will be matched to, the, to this function that depends on C2. So it will allow us to determine C2. Okay. So that's it for EFT matching. Uh, you can ask questions now, or I can tell you how to calculate observables now with, with this Hamiltonian. Maybe I'll pause for questions. Uh, Julio, just a, just a small worry. When, mm -hmm. when you do the EFT calculation, do you get a, an exponential series? It looks to uh, me you get more like a geometric series. Um, I mean, you do get the one over n factorial coming out naturally. So, so I, I will I will explain in a, uh, after the break where the one over n factorial comes from. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, but uh, but but the the basic idea is that uh, just to to advance how it works. The basic idea is that because all of these LZ propagators are linear. Mm. One can actually symmetrize over labelings and use these usual distributional identities, which I will write down to generate a one over n factorial. Ah, okay. and, and one will see the exponential series actually emerging from, from this. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, if not, what I will do is I will tell you how to calculate one of the classical observables using these Hamiltonians. So this scattering angle that Justin was talking about. Also because it will allow us to introduce some of the quantities that we will be using in, uh, in the second part of today's tutorial. Um, so this is the classical dynamics. Okay, so uh, after finding this uh, C1, C2, C3 coefficients, which encode the different post-Minkowskian corrections, what, what we have found is some Hamiltonian that depends on P and R, which looks like this. Um, so, um, So let's say we want to solve the dynamics with this Hamiltonian. So it's always a good idea to think about conserved quantities. So of course we have uh, time translation invariance. So we know that the energy is conserved. So this is conjugate to time. Um, then we, we our Hamiltonian doesn't depend explicitly on, on any angles. It just depends on the distance between the two particles. So we also know that, uh, that the Z component of the angular momentum is gonna be conserved. So this is conjugate to some like angular variable in the scattering plane and also the total angular momentum because, uh, because we just have a central potential. 
Okay, so the dynamics look something like this. So we have a plane where the scattering is happening. So we will choose these to be our Z coordinate. And then we have the particle coming in from infinity. And again, they will scatter through this angle, but more generally what we have, if we choose some origin in this plane, in the center math frame, what we're gonna have is uh, some distance r and some angle theta to any point in the trajectory. So the trajectory is just a function like r of theta or theta of r. Okay, so if we wanna leverage these conserved quantities, then it's useful to think, okay, so here we had everything written in terms of the, the three momentum squared, which is not conserved, but, uh, but in these radial coordinates on the, on the scattering plane, uh, then this three momentum squared is gonna be like a radial part, which we call the radial momentum. And then there's gonna be the centrifugal part, which everyone is familiar with. And then we also have energy conservation. So we know that the energy has to equal our Hamiltonian at any point in the trajectory. And so we see that actually all the, all the dynamics is encoded in this function, which we can actually solve for uh, in terms of the, of the um, radius, the total energy and the angular momentum, because we can just plug in P squared into this Hamiltonian and set it equal to E, and then we can just solve as PR of R, and also a function of the total energy and the angular momentum. So this is just, you know, college two-body problem. I hope everyone is happy with this. If not, ask now. Actually, even if you're happy with it, you can ask uh, because some of these quantities later we will we will be using. So finally, we can calculate the scattering angle. So this is very easy. So we, we have this trajectory, so we can consider this derivative, and then we can just write this as a time derivative or derivative of theta. And this thing is easily related to the radial momentum. This is uh, also related to the, to the momentum in the theta direction. Um, in fact, this is just um, R squared over J e of R. So we have a differential equation for, for um, um, the angle instead of in, in terms of R, um, which we can easily resolve. So we, we, we find that uh, this, so this is the angle plus pi, because in the scattering plane, there was some shift, like our center of mass was not the place where we were measuring uh, the scattering angle. But basically, this is just um, J times the integral along the trajectory, dr, r squared, dr. So everything I did is to separate variables in the differential equation. Okay, so we see that once we had the Hamiltonian, then we can calculate any quantity like, like this one. There's other quantities like the time delay uh, of the scattering process that we could also compute using this Hamiltonian. And um, so in principle, we have solved the classical dynamics, but uh, we had to go through this intermediate quantity, which is the Hamiltonian, um, which uh, is gauge dependent. So I, I didn't say it, but we calculated the Hamiltonian in some very specific gauge, which is called isotropic gauge. So this corresponds to isotropic coordinates in, in GR. Um, so you might ask, 
is there a, is there a more direct route to observables that got, doesn't go through uh, uh, gauge dependent quantities? And that's what we're gonna what we're gonna do after the break. So now I guess we'll break for five minutes, and then I'll try to explain how to do that. Any questions? Hey, Julio, can you hear me? Yeah. So I did have one question, and it may have been addressed yesterday. There was um, some discussion about this, about what role uh, the radiation uh, kinematic region plays in, in um, or, or yeah, what contributions it has to the conservative uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it doesn't go the other way, but, but, but there's this leakage. How, how much of, yeah, what are you throwing away in this EFT? I take it the EFT doesn't capture any of those contributions from the radiation region for the integrated uh, the integrated out gravitons. That's right. That's right. So in fact, this EFT only con captures the dynamics uh, that are mediated by these potential gravitons. Mm -hmm. So at at the up to three pm, that's the full dynamics. Up to order G cube, there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. Starting at um, four pm or also at 4 p.m. in Poznitonian expansion, there's this tail effect that I mentioned yesterday where you have what's called conservative radiation reaction. And uh, what that means is that there's radiation gravitons that can, can escape off to infinity, like several of them, and then come back and hit your particle and you're still at some conservative process, but it, there's some intermediate radiation gravitons. And in fact, the dynamics of that is much more complicated because for instance, if you try to write a Hamiltonian, then uh, you, one cannot write a Hamiltonian which is local in time uh, because, because these radiation um, gravitons, they know about retardation effects. So everything becomes uh -huh. much more complicated. And, and but this, you only phase it for the first time at 4 p.m. order because there is some infrared divergence in this, this angle and these quantities that I'm computing that shouldn't be there. And the reason is because of this split between potential radiation. So I'm ignoring all of that. I'm just talking about the potential dynamics, which up to uh, 3 p.m. is the full conservative dynamic. OK, thank you. OK, more questions? OK, if not, let's just break here and be back in five minutes.
Okay, should, should we get started? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now what I'm gonna try to do now is to make precise some of this intuition that we talked about that the amplitude really is computing the exponential of some quantity, which actually is classical and it's well-defined and, and to see how that connects to the, to the form of the amplitude that, that we discuss and how we can use that directly to calculate um, classical things. And I think uh, the, the, the way I like to think about this is to, to think about, again, the, the scattering amplitude DS matrix. And uh, so far we've been discussing this potential region scattering. So potential, which meant conservative, the gravitons were off shell, right? But this also means that the scattering is elastic. Like energy is conserved, there's nothing escaping off to infinity. Um, we just have two particles coming in, two particles coming out with uh, different directions, the same energy. Okay, uh, so, so what does this mean in terms of the scattering amplitude? So typically when you have any scattering amplitude, you're gonna have a four point amplitude, some five point amplitude where some extra stuff comes out. You're gonna have like an, any kind of multipoint amplitudes, right? But in this conservative process, well, first of all, we don't have particle production. We don't, matter doesn't get created or annihilated, but also we, we, we require that the process is conservative. So there's no gravitons escaping off to infinity. Okay, so that means that all of these guys are zero. And the only non-trivial amplitude for Laska scattering is the four point amplitude. Okay, so what does this have to do with exponentiation? Okay, so typically we wanna write the amplitude. So we write the S matrix equals one plus I M or I T where, where, where T is an operator. And, and then the unitarity of the S matrix, which is just the statement that this matrix is a unitary matrix. Uh, by expanding in terms of M, we find the usual unitarity relations that look something like this. So for instance, for the four point amplitude, we find that the imaginary part, two times imaginary part of the four point amplitude equals what? Equals the sum over all unitarity cuts. There's unitarity cut like this, and then there's gonna be some intermediate stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But if we focus on elastic scattering uh, or conservative scattering, the entire relation is much simpler because this, all of these terms are zero. Um, so typically unitarity involves all multiple amplitudes. So it's a very complicated system of nonlinear equations that one has to solve. Uh, but uh, in this case, it's actually a very simple um, simple uh, equation that tells you that, that the amplitude, the imaginary part of the amplitude equals its two particle cut. So this, this is not perturbative. This can be like multi-loop amplitudes, whatever you want. The only important thing is that there's only a two particle state in between. Okay, so the solution to this equation, uh, we can just write like the fullest matrix is just the four point amplitude. So we can write S directly as a phase. So typically we write one plus IM as I wrote above, but we can just write this as some operator delta, which is the, the basically the logarithm of, of the amplitude. Okay, uh, so this is as operator. And hopefully by now I convince you that the right thing to look at is really not this M, but will be this delta um, that, that will have uh, like better, uh, um, properties in terms of the its classical expansion. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, okay, so let's write the amplitude in terms of delta. So the amplitude is just gonna be um, uh, e to the i delta minus one. So to the leading order is just delta, but then there's corrections to this. So there's a correction, which is minus one half delta delta that up. right? And what this delta, what this product means, this is an operator product. So we do what we usually do in, in quantum mechanics is that we are gonna insert here a complete set of states. 
And this set of states is just a sum over, like in this case, it's going to be a sum over over the phase space. So this is going to be the like d four l one, d four l two, like delta l one squared, delta l two squared, and then like l one l two. So there's only two particle states. So this is very simple. Okay, and of course, any matrix element of, of this thing in general will be um, will be the amplitude. So we recognize that the amplitude is going to be something that looks like like delta plus a hat, where here we have delta. Uh, maybe I shouldn't write it like this because this is not the same as the potential. It's just a matrix element of, of delta. Um, Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is starting to look like uh, like the amplitude we had. To make to make that more precise, we can we can recognize two things. So first of all, I can I can just um, I can simplify uh, again this this phase phase space integral. Uh, so this is the integral over the phase space. So oh, by the way, here we have like l one plus l two is the total incoming momentum. So there's only one independent variable. So we, we can simplify it again by shifting variables and expanding for, for a small q. So here, what we had is that L1, L2 were the momenta flowing here. But instead, we always want to write things in terms of the small momenta, which gets exchanged here. Okay, so when we do that, we get that the phase space integral Uh, sorry, this is L1 squared minus M1 squared because these are massive particles minus M2 squared. So after expanding, this is going to look like minus D2 D dot L plus L squared, L1 squared, and, and something similar, 2 D dot L2 plus L squared. And if we expand in, in small l, we just get that this becomes a transverse integral to leading order. More generally, one has to be careful and do this expansion to, to every order to compute things. But we see that at least to leading order, and, and we know how to expand it systematically, this is just an integral over the transverse space in this l perp variable, um, where l perp uh, is orthogonal to basically to P1 and to P2, like the incoming momentum. Okay, so this is only to leading order, but uh, but th this is a well-defined expansion that what can carry out to high orders, the same way that we were doing the amplitude. Okay, so, uh, so the last thing we need to make contact with, with the amplitude, so now we're gonna have some, some integral only over the transverse space, Whereas when we were doing integrals over amplitudes, we had integrals over three, three states or over three momentum space. Um, so what is the connection between these two? So let me remind you that all of the integrals that we had left to do in the amplitude, once written in terms of these linearized propagators, they took the same form. They took the form like D3 Li L1 D3 N. And then you have like each one of these guys with some power. But then we had this integral over like L1z plus I epsilon, L1z plus L2z plus I epsilon. Okay, um, so what we realize when we look at this formula is that because all of these things are linear uh, and all of this integrand is essentially 
a, a almost permutation invariant. If, if there is not, like if these A's are different, there will be another term in the amplitude that, that where you swap L1 and Ln. So you can actually symmetrize over the labelings and use a distributional identity that tells that this thing plus permutations is basically one over N factorial where N is the, the number of these, these guys um, times like delta L1z. So there's this very simple distributional identity that tells that tells us that all of the i epsilons will combine in the right way. So again, here we had that all the sum of these guys sum to q. Uh, so we see that all of these integrals are automatically localized to the transverse state. Okay, so okay, so when one does this process, one has to be careful about the subleading terms in these delta functions. So there's some angular corrections that one might want to take into account. But the upshot is that the amplitude, after we wrote it in terms of these three-dimensional integrals and, and using this identity looks exactly like the expansion we got in terms of this quantity delta. And uh, so what we learn is that the, the form that we put the amplitude in is kind of ideal to read off delta. Uh, so in fact, the, the amplitude had this finite part that encoded the PM correction. Uh, and then it had all of these iteration parts. Um, and indeed, this will be exactly in correspondence with the different terms in this expansion after we, we take into account these angular corrections. So this, the fact that the delta functions are not exactly the linearized guy, but, but there's an expansion of the delta function. Okay, so this, this was a bit schematic because doing it all in detail is a bit, uh, it wouldn't fit in this lecture, but, uh, but here you saw the, the n factorial that Gabriele was asking about emerge. And we see this exponential structure of the amplitude emerge that will match up with this exponential of Delta that, that we put. Okay, so uh, the last thing before trying to connect to classical quantities. Uh, so there's a, there's a nice way to think about this Delta that will allow us to connect more directly. And again, by thinking about this unitarity equation, so let me call this, like partial waves. So this is a well-known fact that this equation that generically involves some integral here over the two particle phase space. Actually that two particle phase space that I, that I wrote above, if, if, if one doesn't expand in small q, what it really is, so the phase space integral This is just kind of p to some power, like center of mass momentum to some power times an integral over angles. Like the angle between like these intermediate particles here. And because of that, I hope you believe me when I say that if I insert a partial wave expansion of this amplitude on either side, so we're gonna take the amplitude and we're gonna expand it as a sum over partial waves. And depend on the energy. And these are Legendre polynomials. But the angle is, is simply related to T, something like one over less. So Q squared over the energy. When I plug this partial wave extension inside of this elastic unitarity equation, it, it's a simple, it's not, it's not an integral equation anymore that relates an imaginary part of some object to an integral, but it directly tells me that the imaginary part of this partial wave equals its absolute value squared. And the solution to this equation is that AJ is expected equals e to the i delta j e minus one. And typically this is what we call the phase shift. And what we learn from this is that if you actually go to spherical coordinates, this, this matrix element in, in spherical coordinates where we label state by e and the angular momentum of this operator, this will be directly this 
phase shift in the scattering amplitude. And what we learned is that the actual thing that has a nice classical expansion is not the amplitude itself, but the phase shift that you can compute in terms of it. Okay, that was a bit fast, but any questions about that? So again, the argument is we, we, we realize that for elastic scattering, it's more convenient to write the amplitude, the, the S matrix directly as an exponential rather than one plus I M. And then we are trying to understand what this delta is by comparing to our actual calculation of the scattering amplitude. So we don't have a way to compute directly delta because we, I mean, rules just give you the, the, the actual M, the scattering amplitude. So we, we have to use the relation between both, which is given in terms of these, uh, these two particle cuts that emerge when I expand the exponential and insert a complete set of states. And then um, by expanding these in the small Q limit or the small loop momentum limit, uh, we saw the, the same structure that the scattering amplitude had emerging. And, and then we, we, we realized that the, this finite part, the post-Minkowskian correction that was encoded in the scattering amplitude was related to this phase shift. So this is the thing that has a, a well-defined uh, classical expansion, which is just a matrix element of, of delta. If there are no questions about this, um, I will go on to the last part. So now we want to ask, what is this quantity classically? How does this connect to, to classical dynamics? By the way, none of this stuff is really new. Uh, all of this has been known for a long time. It's just that one has to put it in the right form so that it becomes useful to calculate and to compare to, this, to the scattering amplitude. But all of these statements, the fact that this unitarity equation is sort of diagonalized in partial wave space, this is known for a long time. What I'm gonna say now, it's, it's also been known for, for a long time. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about is how to connect this phase shift to some classical quantity. This is through the usual semi-classical approximation. Okay, so this is something that we learn in, in quantum mechanics classes. So if we have like some time evolution, so we have some state that has some like final coordinates, like some time evolution that I evolve with the S matrix, some initial coordinates, right? That can be written as a path integral. So there's some action that depends both on coordinates and momenta. But importantly, this path integral has to be done with fixed boundary conditions for the coordinate. So here we have that Q at like T equals zero equals Q initial, Q at T equals T equals Q final. Okay, so what is this S? S we can write in terms of the Hamiltonian, like QP, something nice, it looks like this, but it's gonna be E BQ minus the Hamiltonian um, BQ. So this is for, for a general system with some canonical coordinates and some canonical momenta. You can you can choose your favorite one. Um, and then the, the, the semi-classical approximation that we usually talk about, we just ask, okay, so there particularly there's an H bar here. So we ask in the limit in of h bar going to zero, what is the leading contribution to this path integral? And of course, it's just the saddle point. So the, the place where, where this guy is stationary and their first variations, right? Um, so what is the variation of this action? Okay, so this is gonna be the integral delta P, the equation of motion for P, Delta Q, the equation motion for Q, and then there's a boundary term. 
which is going to look like delta p dot q, uh, delta q dot p, sorry, at t equals zero and t equals t. Okay, so we see that if we choose the solution that satisfies the boundary conditions and it has fixed coordinates at the boundaries, then this first variation of the action is zero. And, and our matrix element to first order in H bar is well approximated by this where I plug in the classical solution. Let me write it below. Okay, so this is just a stationary phase approximation to the path integral. And what I mean by Q classical P classical is just the actual classical solution, the solution of the equation of motion with those prescribed boundary conditions. Okay, so this is almost what we want, except that the process that we are considering uh, is not a process with fixed coordinates. We are, we are computing a scattering amplitude where we actually fix the momenta at infinity. Okay, so. Uh, um, so if we were computing this, then the ex this exponential would look something like this. So this exponential, right? If I choose this variable, so I remember that uh, we, okay, let, me, let me write this somewhere else. The nice way to solve the classical dynamics was to choose coordinates that are related to conserved quantities. So this kind of, some of these go as by the name of action angle variables. Uh, but this, this uh, uh, semi-classical um, integral, sorry, um, action will look something like this. So if I choose coordinates where I have like J, which is conjugate to this angle uh, or to theta, and then I have E, which is conjugate to time, and then we have like this radial momentum, which is conjugate to R, right? then this formula that I gave you here. So H is conserved along the trajectory. So we're gonna get this uh, minus the energy the time difference. We're gonna get J comes out here. So if we have J the angle, this is gonna look like J times the angle. And then there's gonna be another piece, which is, uh, which is um, this integral over the radial momentum. Yeah. The element trajectory. So this almost looks like what we want, but as it will turn out, these pieces are not there because this is uh, the action computed with fixed uh, canonical coordinates. So instead, what we have is fixed momenta. Okay, so why is this important? It seems like some weird subtlety, but it's important because in this formula that I wrote above, You see, if we, if we solve the equation of motion, these two terms will always vanish, but then this term here will only vanish if Q is, is fixed at the boundary or at, at, the, at the endpoints of the, of the classical trajectory. But if we fix the momenta instead of the coordinates, this term won't be zero, so this semi-classical approximation won't. Okay, so we want to, what we want to construct is some, some quantity that will give us the, the, right, the right behavior. And it turns out that that action is the following. Um, so let me just write that point. Like S delta S is not equal zero if P fix instead of Q. And it's even worse than that because the variational problem is not well defined with, with this action that we wrote. So this action that we wrote just doesn't make sense if we, you, even if you wanna solve the classical dynamics. So what is the right object that one has to write? The right object is the following. Uh, so the, the action that we'll have, so this is um, like semi-classical approximation. Okay, 
6.6p. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, so the right object is, we just need to add a boundary term. So like the right object I will call I is gonna be S minus T dot Q evaluated at the boundary. So at T equals zero and T equals T. Okay, and, and why is this well-defined? Because when I vary this guy, then this will give me the variation of S, which I wrote above. But now there's gonna be some subtraction term that's gonna look like delta P dot Q, like initial and final, minus delta Q dot P, initial and final. And this term will cancel the dangerous term in, in our orig original variational problem. So the semi-classical approximation with, with these guys, uh, it will be well-defined. And long story short, what this achieves is that the action that we have, the, the one that will give us the amplitude, is not this guy, but it's this guy, where I've just eliminated this. And then I've also subtracted basically, uh, basically the value of P at infinity. So this comes from, from Q being R, P being PR, and then the other two terms that I had, well, sorry, I, I, I said something wrong. This only cancels the, 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 the term with the angle. Uh, something else that happens is that because we want the fixed energy, uh, we also want the endpoints of, the, of the, the time being fixed versus variable. So if you want to fix energy, you cannot fix the, the time of the initial and the final process. And, and there's a similar term that you need to add here, which is minus energy times the time. And, and this term will cancel the, um, so this will give delta T, delta E, delta T minus uh, delta T, E. So sorry about that, but after you add these terms, you find that the right object to look at is this combination here. And so this, this thing has a name. So this thing is called the radial action. When it's evaluated in the semi-classical approximation and then the scattering amplitude um, will be actually like in the semi-classical approximation, it will be like, e to the times i over h bar minus one. So this quantity that we defined before, this p of r, um, is one one can use to calculate this thing, and and we have the direct connection to the scattering amplitude. So so the finite part of the scattering amplitude. So this before we saw that this was also the phase shift. So the finite part of the scattering amplitude is the scattering phase shift, which is directly related to this semi-classical onshell action. So if we can calculate the finite part that encoded the PM corrections, then we have this, this classical object. And this provides the last ingredient that we needed to calculate observable. The reason is because the derivatives of this radial action are the observable. So this, the differential, so this is The differential of this radial action is going to be the scattering angle times dj plus the time delay times the energy. And if you fix, so, so this means that this thing is delta i delta j, and this thing is delta i delta j. <laughs> So what this means is that once we've calculated the amplitude, what we find is directly this radial action given by the finite part of the amplitude, which is directly connected to, to this classical observable. So we achieve what we wanted, which is to find some quantity that with some gauge invariant quantity, which is this thing. So this is gauge invariant because it's evaluated on shell, it's evaluated along the trajectory um, in terms of which we can calculate the observables directly. 
and uh, so this has a catch, which is that we evaluated this in a scattering trajectory. That's why we got this, this um, uh, scattering angle or this time delay. But as it turns out, this full ray election, maybe Raphael will tell us about it next week, um, can be analytically continued to, to yield the radial action for the in-spiral problem too, at least in the conservative setup. Um, so from this quantity, from this radial action, which is the fundamental gauge invariant classical quantity, um, one can compute also observables in the gauge invariant observables in the in the bound problem. And, and this nice quantity is directly related to the scattering amplitude. So we achieved our goal, which is to get some direct route from gauge invariant quantities which are quantum like the amplitude to classical gauge invariant quantities like the radial action in terms of which we can calculate observables. And okay, I think I'll finish there. Sorry, I rushed a little bit towards the end, but uh, um, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so is there any questions to Julio? If nobody asks, can I talk? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fairly. Okay. So we, you didn't mention anything about the other way, right? The way we did it, uh, but we can discuss that uh, later. Uh, did I understand correctly that all you said here is like you found a way to get the phase shift, and the derivative of the phase shift in the saddle point is the angle, and that must be the radial action. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's everything I said. Okay. It's just that it, it, it sounds very simple, that, but the important thing that I'm kind of swapping under the rug is that we found a way to put the amplitude, the full theory amplitude in a form that is optimal to, yes. to, uh, to calculate this phase shift. Uh, so if, if there is another way to calculate the phase shift, uh, it would be great, yeah. That's right, which is different than our way with the PNs. Yeah. I see. Right. I, okay, and the other question is that uh, like, um, like Justin mentioned, and I will actually cover this in my talk as well how you get the high orders in J for the flux, but you also need the high orders in J in the radial action to get the conservative sector. And one way we right. do that is because we know, like Justin said, right? You can go to the PNs. It's not really the Hamiltonian, it's the P square, right? And from those, you can reproduce the higher order terms of the radial action. So even though you don't control the, all the PN corrections at one over J, because maybe you can say that there's a PM expansion of the radial action. Maybe we don't control all of them, we know from lower orders, like the arc tangent for the scattering angle of Newton, right? You can predict them all. So you mm -hmm. know from lower orders how to predict the higher order terms. How would you do right. that if you go straight to the radial action, if you don't know the PNs, the coefficients? It's, of a, it's, it's the same thing. You need to assume that there is, I mean, you can assume there is a Hamiltonian. You, you can assume there is an impetus. Yes. Uh, but under any of those two assumptions, then you can recover the whole PN series. But, but that is an, I mean, that's, that's a different assumption that we can input now. So now we could do two things. We could do what Justin said. We could write a ham, our Hamiltonian, calculate the angle or the radial action. So I just told you that the radial action is simply this integral. Yes, but my question is it's, it's a little different. Oh. My question is like, we went through this fierce of relationship that then we can forget about where it came from. We know how the higher order, the higher order terms depend on the lower order terms. It's true we constructed it through a Hamiltonian or a P square, but by itself it's true and you can say, okay, this came just from the expansion. Could you do the same from the amplitude without ever looking at the Hamiltonian? That's what I'm saying. It's the fields well, of I mean, form that's somewhere hidden in your amplitude. You well, you I mean? still have to use the Hamiltonian, right? So I think you can, you can either assume there is a Hamiltonian or an impetus, and then you can do it with a first off formula or or whatever way you want, uh, or, or you cannot assume it. So I think if you don't assume it, there is no way you can do it in your okay, way or was, our way. That was the answer I was, I was getting at, because we always seem to rely on the existence of this object. Even though you don't really need to calculate it, you have yeah. to assume that it exists, which bothers me a little because I would like to go astray without knowing it, right? Right, right. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense, but so basically, I mean, what you're saying is that the existence of Hamiltonian seems to tell you more than the PM expansion of this radial action. Exactly. That there uh, is a local object that you can span in one of our R tells you a lot. And I'm going to use that yes. information to fix the flux problem that, that uh, Justin talked about. We have to go mm -hmm. through that. That there is a flux function 
that has a well of our expansion. And we're going to do exactly the same that we do with fields up, but for the flux. Okay, I'm looking forward to hear about that. Okay, good. Is there any other questions or comment to, to Julio? Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Hi, Julio. Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, video? I mean, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Sure. Hello? No. Yeah, so ju just to sort of see if I understand the logic of the last. So the the discussion about this delta mm -hmm. that you defined so so that's sort of a as you said it's it's a way to repackage the information in your amplitudes uh, to to then i mean essentially what you do is take the amplitudes extract this partial waves and that's already gives you like this strong link to the phase shift that's is that right. the main the main point okay yeah that's that's the whole point yeah. and and is the radial action like exactly equal to this delta expectation values or what is the relation between the two in the in the semi-classical limit yes in the semi-classical limit the phase shift is just this quantity here right 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 the the, oh. the radial action evaluated along the classical trajectory yeah okay. so so there's a, I, I didn't say much but there is a, a very closely related approach which is called the iconal approach which is kind of the the um, limit it's kind of uh, a limit of, of this in the sense that what that one, one does in the iconal approach is one doesn't include all of these angular corrections. So one doesn't take into account that the, what we are doing is really a two particle phase space integral but one just takes the linear part of that. And there's still an exponentiation happening which is similar to, to this diagonalization of unitarity that I was talking about. But, but the difference is that there's these angular corrections that you have to control and in particular if you don't want to compute those to, to, to extract the relaxation, you don't have to. And in fact, in, in these PM calculations that we do, we, we, we avoid uh, computing those because uh, thanks to going to these 3D integral bases, we can identify which pieces will be, become an angular correction and which pieces are genuinely classical. Um, so we can, we can see ahead of time which pieces we don't need to compute uh, and then and then do this process. Whereas if if you do it the you know the classical iconal way, you would have to compute the full amplitude, then take the logarithm, uh, and and then see how all the pieces cancel, including these angular corrections. But that would mean that you still have to calculate these angular corrections. Um, yeah. I see. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You have a question or comment? What do you mean by the angular corrections? I mean, okay, do I have it here? Okay, I don't have it here. Let me just write it again. What I mean is that the logarithm that I'm taking. What I mean is that this exponential, right? When I expand this, what goes in here, it's an actual full like two particle phase space integral. Meaning I have like the full, like two P dot L plus L squared and like also for the other guy. And it's not just the linearized delta function that tells you that this is actually a convolution. So it's a, what I mean by angular correction is the difference between the transverse convolution and the full two particle phase space integral. So the, the, the right way to take the logarithm, it's not the right way. Like the, the way I like to, to take the logarithm is to, uh, to think of it as an operator where I, I always insert two particle phase. And also, if one does it this way, one sees that instead of this uh, iconal impact parameter that one gets usually when one does the iconal approximation, you get the ordinary impact parameter out of this semi-classical approximation. Um, so that's my 
That's what I mean by, by angular corrections, is the difference between this delta function and the expansion in small l. But in practice, to compute this quantity, you have to go through the amplitude or not? Yes, but, but the, the important thing is that I know the form of these angular corrections. And by going through the 3D integral basis, we can avoid computing those. So we can see ahead of time where they will arise. And we can, we can uh, add to the order that we have computed. And we believe it, it can be done also to, we, we, we hope we can do it at high orders. Um, um, we, can, we can tag those pieces ahead of time and just not compute them. Um, so for instance, just to give a specific example that you might be familiar with, if one calculates the box integral in the soft expansion, right? Then there is the leading order, which is a convolution of three level. But then there's a piece, which is order epsilon, and it's suppressed by Q, which looks like a triangle and a bubble, et cetera, et cetera. Turns out that all of those pieces just encode these angular corrections. And the full box in the potential region equals its imaginary part. So if one keeps the full two phase phase integral, one sees that the whole series expansion of the box actually cancels in the logarithm versus just the leading order. I don't know if that make, made it more clear, but. I was confused because uh, you talked up all the time about phase shift and you mm -hmm. never mentioned iconal. In the end, you mentioned iconal and uh, I realized that they were not the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They're slightly different because of, because of this. It's, it, it's, it, the, the story is the same if you replace convolution by two particle phase space integral. That's the only difference between iconal and the exponentiation I was looking. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else wants to make a comment or ask a question? Just a very quick one. Uh, I mean, this um, radial action is already in Landau Lifshitz. Mm -hmm. If you look at the chapter on motion in a spherically symmetric field, I mean, defines S sub R and the scattering angle is related to the derivative of that with respect to mm -hmm. the moment. Right. So, um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite clear that from a quantum amplitude point of view, that's what you are looking after indeed. Now for, yeah, for the, for the discussion about impact parameter versus angular momentum, because, sorry, um, it's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the difference between impact parameter space and angular momentum, of course, yeah, there is a relation. Now, what you can, if you prefer to work in impact parameter space because somehow the integrals are easier. I mean, you can always define the Fourier transform uh, from, you know, from momentum transfer to impact parameter space and, you know, and check exponentiation and so on and so forth. And then at the end, you know, when you have your amplitude resumed, go over mm -hmm. to angular momentum. I mean, this you can do. So, right. I mean, it's a trade-off. I don't know. Uh, I mean, but I, I certainly so I, agree with you that somehow the difference between the impact parameter and the true angular momentum has to be taken into account. Not to leading order, but it comes up to order angular mo um, deflection angle cube, you know. Mm -hmm. To that order, the difference matters. Right. I think the 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 point that I, I would like to make related to that comment is that it would seem naively that the integrals are easier if you do it in angular if you just do the transverse Fourier transform. But in this way of reducing everything to three dimensional integrals, um, th that is actually 
not, not the case. In fact, we find it easier to go directly to these three-dimensional integrals because there you can see the cancellation directly. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the advantage of this three-dimensional integral is that it, it lets you keep track of inverse powers of velocity and, uh, and of order Q corrections in coefficients that have inverse powers of velocity. So if you, again, to, to, to repeat the comment I made to, to Paolo, um, the box integral at one loop, to, to any order that you're looking at in the Q expansion, it has a one over velocity. So mm -hmm. you know that that thing has to cancel in the phase shift. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by going to this three-dimensional integral basis, you can, you can make that explicit in step one, rather than having to compute the expansion to high orders. And then every order higher that you go in the iconal, you have to compute one higher quantum correction to the amplitude to subtract it. So the advantage of this, this classical integral, these 3D integrals is that you can see very clearly what is classical and what is quantum. So that you can ignore it when you're computing the amplitude versus in the usual approach where you just expand everything then you always have to go back to the previous order and compute to higher orders to, to make sure that mm -hmm. that everything cancels so mm -hmm. in fact when we are doing this calculation we are not computing the full amplitude to the classical order we are already ignoring the pieces that that mm -hmm. we are not interested in mm -hmm. yeah i mean you talk about 2d integrals i mean they're always 2d you mean angular integrals rather than uh, uh, trans? No, no, three three dimensional. Like the the, oh, the basis that mean. comes up. Yeah, yeah. The 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 one that comes out naturally of the effective theory. Um, yeah. So, but by the way, another point that I, that I think it's uh, can be clarifying is that all of this discussion, if one tries to carry it over in the full theory, it can be very confusing because the full theory is very complicated, it has many diagrams, there's many things going on. Mm -hmm. But oh, because the full theory, like the dynamic, the conservative dynamics of the full theory is described by the effective theory, any proof that you want of exponentiation or, or of anything can be carried out in the effective theory directly, where all of the integrals are much simpler. In particular, the numerators are trivial. There's no, like the, the tensor reduction is much simpler. One only deals directly with these three dimensional integrals. So, um, so it, it's very efficient to do this uh, directly in the effective theory. And actually, this was realized by Shashen. I don't know if he's around, uh, but uh, Shashen Shen, who's uh, one of my collaborators, uh, stressed this point uh, actually a couple of years ago already in, in QCD meets gravity, I think. And and we 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 use that uh, um, to to simplify these calculations. Julio, I guess one of the trade-off of this approach is that you are restricted to the potential region, right? I mean, you, you cannot see the exponentiation for the full classical theory. Well, so I don't have a formal argument why it should exponentiate, right? So what, I, what do one means by the logarithm becomes a bit more murky once you have multi-particle states, but, uh, but there might be a way to, to think, I mean, I can define formally this delta for an arbitrary amplitude, and I can like say the same words that I said and take the logarithm in this special way and, and that should produce some answer. I, I just don't have an interpretation for that answer in terms of a classical quantity. Uh, well, well, I mean, that, uh, that should be the true iconal, right? I mean, the, 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 yeah. the, 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 the factor of H bar should exponentiate in the usual way. Uh, and that, I mean, there should be a classical limit for that case as well. I, I agree, I agree, I agree, yeah, yeah. It's just that here, it, there were two things. One is just the exponentiation per se, and the other one is how we organize things in such a way that we can make this manifest when we calculate the amplitude. Yeah. And for the full of amplitudes, we don't we don't have as of now a, a way of doing the same thing. Can I ask you a question? Yes. I don't know if we have to cut off, maybe go into discussion and I don't know. I don't wanna hijack again this discussion. Okay. So, okay, Ming, go ahead. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so, you know that we thought about something like this, right? How to get mm -hmm. this object directly, right? The scalar object, not the impulse from which we mm -hmm. get the angle, which has all the components, right? And the B and the U direction, the U direction that actually screws you later, right? Exactly mm -hmm. at chi q. Um, 
So do you think about, so are you telling me that I should have just computed the, the action with fixed momentum and that will be my radial action? So this will be my object? Uh, you mean including the... Because I compute an impulse, right? Yeah, you compute an impulse. Exactly. I would say, don't take the derivative under the integral sign, compute directly the integral of the, of the action evaluated on the trajectory. And that should be the real. But it's not enough, right? Because I, all, all, I get both. I get the B and the U direction when from the impulse, I get the answer. Yes. yes. So, so you have more information because you have the full kind of off-shell integrand exactly. of the semi-classical action. And that, that is something that we don't have. Like the amplitude just knows about the action integrated along the trajectory. So the same way that knowing the Hamiltonian, we can compute other quantities. Um, um, or, or like, for instance, the trajectories of the particles you can compute with Hamiltonian, you cannot compute them with the amplitude. You will have to derive a Hamiltonian from the amplitude or from, from the radial action by assuming that it exists and reading of coefficients and then compute it. So I, I agree, like the more of shell you go, the, the wider range of kind of quantities that you can compute, but- uh, No, but, my, uh, yeah, my question yeah. was more in the direction whether we could do uh, Kosauer maybe or Connell of the radial action, including now the radiation reaction, because we will go straight for this guy. So that connects to Rodolfo's question. So I don't know what that object is. I don't know what the, if you include radiation, I don't know what the semi-classical action is, but it's a, it's a well-defined gauge invariant quantity, which presumably will be related to the, to the amplitude in some way, at least if you have like, prescribed boundary conditions, not like initial state boundary conditions, like a boundary values instead of initial conditions. So I think that's the basic gauge invariant object. And then you can ask the question that you ask is, okay, how many quantities can I extract from this? How many observables can I extract from this? But uh, I, I sympathize with, with your papers that want to like map directly gauge invariant quantities to gauge invariant quantities. I think that is the amplitude's way of doing things. And, and the, the, the better we get at that, then uh, the, the happier I will be. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, I want to learn from this latest development because the way we did it, and we also used the effective theory to prove that the amplitude mm -hmm. in, the, in the impact parameter space is related to the momentum, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a nice way to do it, and you're doing the same thing, right? Was precisely trying to map this gauge invariant information, and then the radial action is this very complicated function of the momentum. Mm -hmm. and then you realize it was actually the angle and now you actually realize and it was the radial action all the time, right? So that's yeah. the full circle, right? And it does smell like all the radiation can be fit into the exact same picture. It will be an in type mm -hmm. calculation, but the radial action will be there. The analytic continuation will be there. Everything seems to smell like Kosauer maybe O'Connell works as well for the local and non-local pieces and so on, right? Yeah. And, so yeah. may maybe I'll make one more comment. So the radial action is nice because it's going to the amplitude. But it's complicated, and in particular, it's very hard to understand like non-perturbative structures, how things resum, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, we know that the this radial action in the problem it should give the angle in Schwarzschild, but the angle in Schwarzschild is a very complicated thing. Right? Yes. The angle in Schwarzschild, we don't have a closed formula in terms of like or, ordinary functions. It's some complicated. Thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so. Uh, this object that you use, this impetus, which is coordinate dependent, is not a Hamiltonian, but it's, uh, but it's coordinate dependent still. It's actually much simpler than both the Hamiltonian and the radial action. Oh yeah, yes. Uh, so in, 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 uh, if you read this recent paper by, by Cliff Chung and Michael Salon and uh, Cliff Sir and Naba, they understood how to do like all orders calculations in some perturbative limit in the probe limit, like including tidal corrections, but to get formulas for this impetus to all orders in G. Um, and they're ordinary formulas. They're not like some elliptic integral. They're like some simple function of the angular momentum and other quantities. I see. So I think the impetus is a nice quantity to think about. It, it's just that there's one extra step to relate it to the amplitude, but in a sense, it's, it's nicer than the Hamiltonian. Uh, Totally. Uh, yeah. If you look at the P3 versus the C3, the difference is huge, right? P3 is very simple and C3 is complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it carries so, a charge, right? Because the M3 is the amplitude and it's gauge invariant. So this isotropic gauge, in a sense, is gauge invariant information, right? So, yeah. But 
but uh, the, I think also the uh, a comment is that the amplitude we know that in a different basis for this 3D integral, what the original basis is y poles, it's related directly to the impulse. The problem with that basis is that it's very hard to do integrals to high orders because it's kind of tuned to doing like order in, like one order in velocity at a time versus, because it has quadratic propagators versus this um, this um, this uh, new way of doing it with linearized propagators uh, makes the integrals much simpler. But ideally one would get directly the impetus from the amplitude, but still being able to calculate using uh, using the full like uh, machinery for linearized propagators. I yeah. think that would be nice. Why, yeah. why do you think it's simplified? Because at the end, we, we sort of get the same integrals after you do all the expansions, soft expansion, classical limit. We should land in the same integrals, right? So why do you don't see also the simplification? Because they reorganize themselves differently? Yeah, yeah. And also, like, certain yeah. integrals are not homogeneous in Q, right? Uh, like, the, 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 the integrals that they originally used in the EFT matching, which is not the way I've explained it, they're not homogeneous in, in, in the classical power counting. And that means that if you want to get those from some like integration technology, you will have to have a non-trivial function of Q. Whereas in our case, everything is fixed by, I think someone, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, as I was saying, the nice thing about the linearized integral is that they only depend on velocity and all the other dependence is trivial. It's just dimension analysis versus the original integrals, they, they have, they depend on energies and those energies include like mass corrections. There's like Q, there's Qs floating around and in general, those will be more complicated. I see. So you're closer to the classical integral now than you were before, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Well, I think we are switching between question to Julio to open discussion session. So, uh, so in a sense, I mean, uh, I think you can feel free yes, to have this uh, open discussion and uh, discuss more general uh, question than just the, the lecture by Julio. By the way, my question was directed because if you look at Firsov, which by the way, we also learned from Landau and Lifshitz and the, the inspiration for the radial action for us, Gabriele also came from uh, Landau and Lifshitz and some old papers of Divo who did this in PN. Um, it's this connection of P squared, this is what we call impetus to the angle. And that looks a lot like, and P squared is now the amplitude, right? Because we have the connection in the, in the Y basis to the amplitude. It does smells like there should be an understanding from the amplitude point of view, how this first formula came about, which is inverting mm -hmm. the relationships that you get from the Hamilton. So it smells a lot. It's not quite the iconal, right? But it's something iconal like that goes into this P square B, B E to the I and integral of the, of the angle, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it does smell like this P square knows so much and it's a gauge invariant in isotropic coordinates related that it has to be something in the amplitude. Maybe we haven't found the right basis to think about it, right? Which carries a lot of the actual physical information in the system because this P3 gives you everything at, 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 at 3 p.m., right? So, mm -hmm. and this is all you care about, not even the angle, not the C3s, so it's really P3 the right guy, right? So we always go back and forth with Gregor, what do we like more, Chi3 or P3? Because P3 rocks, right? Yeah, that's that's the comment I was making. That the what what is simpler, the radial action versus versus this impetus. And there's, I mean, it's a trade off because, as I said, the good thing about the impetus is that Cliff and, and friends have told us how to understand things to very high orders uh, and use the different morphisms and in, like n nice changes of coordinates to do things. So that's one advantage of having something which is slightly gauge dependent. But uh, the nice thing, for instance, about the radial action is that the self-force expansion is completely manifest. Um, so the, the, ma the, the dependence on the masses is trivialized. And this has to do again with, with using linearized propagators versus quadratic propagators where the dependence on Q, which is directly related to dependence on the masses is uh, manifested. Um, well, but from the classical calculation, it's almost trivial, right? It goes through the impulse. 
So the mass scaling is, is literally trivial. We actually found the mass scaling before when we proved Justin's map between the angle and he was generalizing them to all. Yeah, yeah. but what I mean by that is that if say I go to the next order, so so from from you guys and also uh, the more and others, uh, we, we learned that um, that uh, certain terms of the self-ordered expansion, uh, we they are basically fixed at, at each order uh, from from the previous order. So you are only interested in the new the new self force piece, right? Like at at four p.m. everything we had was like uh, one SF, um, and uh, so one could imagine saying, okay, I go to the next order. I don't want to calculate all the lower like self force corrections because uh, hopefully someone like uh, well, let's just say we understand those. Um, I just want to calculate the new self force like at, at four loops. Let's calculate the two SF, right? Then if, if I use the Y basis, if I use the impetus, I would have to first compute the whole thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then expand and then I would find the right piece. Whereas from the amplitude, I can directly tell which integrals will give me that self force correction. And if I didn't want, and the coefficient of each one of those is gauge invariant. So, so be, because the mass dependence picks out like gauge invariant pieces of the amplitude. By the way, now that you mentioned the connection to the way we do things in Feynman diagrams, in Feynman diagrams, this is also trivial because the mass scaling is just where do you put the line? So that you can also pick up from the diagrams, right? Yeah, so I think that is true for the ones that are directly diagrams. I think when you insert the lower order trajectory. Oh, but you can just then... keep the one that it kicks you from the other guy and that's it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's the same thing. Like if you can do the same in the y basis, but then the, the diagrams that are non-trivial are not are the ones that are iterations. So the self-force dependence of the of the diagrams that appear for the first time at a given order, it's it's always obvious, even in the y basis. But it's always the one that you have to expand to subleading order in Q to get to the classical piece. Are, those are the iteration diagrams, which are tricky. So the, the the leading diagrams are always in any formalism, they're they're always trivial. Yes. Now our iterations in the effective action are also symmetric by construction, right? So you can just keep half of them, right? Mm -hmm. Because the input is d by dv one or dv two is just a minus sign. So right, right. Cool. Yeah, maybe because there's this there's this related approach to what you do by Jan and Gustav and Gustav yeah, and, and Jan, like Jan squared. We, we actually show that what they say about iconal is not right. It doesn't give the right answer. Now, I don't well, know. I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know about that, but what I, what I was gonna say is that uh, they have, instead of what you do, which is you use word lines, but you still solve classical equation of motion. So you do directly kind of the semi-classical approximation to their, to their word line path integral. What they do is they derive Feynman rules for the path integral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we tried this with Gregor, but we got stuck because then you have a higher order, non-linearities of the world line itself, like cubic interactions of X. And we just didn't yeah. like that because that was just iterating Green's functions of the solution of the classical equation. And I thought mm -hmm. that doing only like Grange, which were some of those, is much easier, right? Systematically, right? Of course, conceptually, it's very nice to have the full world line as a line, right? Yeah. But, but computationally, it doesn't help you, right? So what I was going to say is that it might help in, in disentangling this, this mass counting, because for them, it's clear what is an iteration. Well, there's, there, there's no real iteration, but it's clear when you have like the unperturbed word line versus the perturbed word line to a given order. And yeah. those are separated without, with all the mass dependence factored out. Um, so, uh, so I think in a sense, what you're computing is like the saddle point of their path integral. Yes. But, uh, but their path integral has this nice feature that, that everything is a diagram and the mass dependence is always yes. trivial. Yes, but the number of diagrams escalates much quicker and taking derivatives of an action is much simpler, which is what we do. So I agree, I agree. No, conceptually it's nice, but there is a claim there which would be awesome if it was true about this exponential because we could go just to the scale, directly to that scalar function, but I think it doesn't, it doesn't work. Huh. Well, I think, I think it, it I don't know what is the precise statement in their in their paper. I don't remember, but I think spiritually it's similar to what I was talking about. So there might yes. be a way to make it work. It's just that yeah, what that... do you mean by exponential? It, it has to be like defined carefully. And at exactly. leading order, any definition gives the same answer. And at high orders, you have to exactly. Think, uh, I think what you just what you show mean. here 
is that they are perhaps discovering the radial action directly in, in not an impact parameter space, but in angular momentum. And yeah. they insist to keep the V. If you take D by DB, obviously it doesn't work. So it's mm -hmm. not really the iconal that they are after, but they are after the radial action. That would be yeah. really, yeah, that's what we're actually exploring. That, that's the conjecture that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's very natural. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one thing that confused me is that uh, uh, the approach that you follow, that also the approach of the iconal, you have to exponentiate. Mm -hmm. But the approach that uh, Raphael and Gregor follow, uh, they don't have to exponentiate. And they that's still compute the scattering angle. Yeah, that, so P3 that's why... Gives, gives completely the scattering amplitude. Yeah, that's, that's the difference between, between computing an effective action directly and then using that to evaluate whatever you want so in effective action there's never never an iteration so that's kind of an off-shell matching in the in effective theory uh, and and what we do is kind of matching an on-shell quantity like an amplitude but then you need to exponentiate and take care of iterations etc cetera, etc cetera. but what they're doing is is matching the action directly which is already exponentiated and then you can you can use that to compute whatever you want uh, so if there was a way to do that in QFT directly, that would be very nice. I, I haven't found a way to directly compute the exponent using Feynman rules, but there, there might be a way of, of directly computing like the phase shift using some set of rules, which for the word line, it's what, what Raphael does. He computes the, the, the word line effective action and then evaluates it on the system. No, but he computes P3 directly from the scattering amplitude at P3, at the scattering amplitude that is in the paper by Ben et al. Well, P3. So, so, so yes, but, but well, that, that is how to get this impetus. So I, I thought you were talking about their post Minkowski and EFT papers. So it, that, that is a non-trivial fact that this impetus is directly related to the to the finite part of the amplitude. So this was observed to like to fix order in, in this paper by Zui and friends, and then uh, Raphael and Gregor proved it to all orders. Uh, and uh, so I agree that is non-trivial that, that there you don't need to exponentiate this impetus is directly this, this function. Uh, I think that's, I mean- Is it true it's, it's, it, in all case or not? I mean, I, they, I mean, they prove to all orders that if you can put your amplitude in this Y basis, which is not the linearized propagator basis that I described, but is the one with the quadratic propagators, then then it's true to all orders that that gives the impetus and it gives the scattering angle. But there is no, I, I don't think there is an exponentiation there. They just identified that that finite part of the amplitude is this other quantity in, in terms of which the, the the angle is, is very simple or the real action can be given in terms of in terms of it so they they basically found the ra this radial momentum directly inside of the amplitude um, yeah. but but this relies crucially on choosing the right basis in the EFT so if you, there's there's an infinite number of choices of how to expand this two body propagator so you can pick your favorite uh, uh, choice and and most choices will give uh, uh, nothing interesting. And there's a few choices that give interesting things. One of them is this quadratic propagator that gives the, the impetus. Another interesting choice is the linearized propagators, which makes the exponentiation structure manifest and it connects to the radial action. But I mean, in their case, they don't look at the effective action, effective uh, field theory. They look at the, at the original microscopic field theory. No, no, but it's very important that that amplitude computed in the full theory was put in the form suggested by the effective theory. So it's crucial that the, the separation between iteration and finite part is done in a very specific way that without the effective theory, one wouldn't have thought about this. So, so the effective theory plays an important role even in that calculation because it tells you how, in which shape you want to put your full theory amplitude to read off this quantity. Uh, so it's the same here. Like all of this exponentiation structure um, uh, was understood by Xia Shen basically in the EFT first. And because then the dynamics 
in the AFT, they have to agree with the dynamics, the, the relevant dynamics in the full theory, then one can try to put the full theory in the same form uh, as the EFT to, to extract what you want. But the, the effective theory always plays a, an important role. Another, oh. way, another way to say that is that when we prove this to all orders, we basically did the Schrodinger equation. So it's a P square. And then you do all the iterations, the Bohr iterations and so on. And then you see all the infrared poles. If those match on the left-hand side, then whatever is left over is finite and is your impetus. For that to cancel out, you have to choose what, what he said, the P-square propagators. Otherwise, they don't cancel. So the IRs cancel in the right basis only. So mm -hmm. when you put it on the other side, better give you a finite answer. And for that to be finite, you have to reorganize the poles in a specific way. Because 1 over I epsilon, 1 over epsilon IR plus a constant is still a pole. So what they do is reshuffle. In a way, there are different reshuffles that give you different finer pieces. That's basically what's happening. Yeah. No, but I mean, you take the amplitude that Bernetal computed, the conservative part. Yeah, but they use yeah. the p-square basis. They match into a p-square. Uh, so it's a non-relativistic. It's relativistic, but it's literally <laughs> the, non the PN expansion of the of the relativistic goes into the non-relativistic to all orders in velocity, right? So it's really the p-square propagator of Schrodinger that they use. That's this square root of p square plus m square. It's really p square plus p4, blah, blah, blah. So it's really Schrodinger. They are showing how Schrodinger matches. And we just extracted that and showed that this was true to all orders. That they might, maybe he can write it down. And <laughs> he's going to yeah, write it. Let me, let me just write it down because then it will be clearer. And maybe in the midnight, so, I can try maybe to, to add, maybe to, to try to rephrase, maybe in terms that Paolo is more familiar with. So you remember that. So and et al also have some remaining integrals that they, they, they leave unevaluated, right? In, uh, in they are, which are also the ones that give one over epsilon parts. So if I understand correctly, the important point is that you should package these guys and throw them away, right? Right, that's so, exactly right. So, yeah. so the original choice was something like this. So this is at one loop. So there's some finite part. And there's a part that looks like a three-dimensional integral with a pole, which is quadratic. So this pole goes like 2p dot l plus l squared. And, and this finite part, this is related to impetus. Where does this pole come from? This pole maybe, comes from, from expanding the two, the two the, body propagator. For the, those out there that they don't know what impetus means. Uh, yeah, so impetus is like, you can write this thing as t at infinity, so the, the basically the central mass momentum of infinity, and then there's some object here. And basically, the the, the idea is that this object here is directly in a part the amplitude when put into this basis. So there's a choice made here, which is originally we had these two body propagators that had one over E minus square root minus square root. And in order to put that into a form that we can compare to the full theory, one had to expand its square roots. But there's one choice, which is to expand around this pole, like something that is quadratic in L. And, and that gave the relation of the finite part to this impetus. So, so this is the Fourier transform of the, of the finite part of the amplitude in the Y basis. But then a different choice, so this is still the full theory amplitude. A different choice, which is suggested by, by these arguments about exponentiation. So this is uh, finite z, where here what we have is, uh, is an integral that looks like d3l, l squared, l minus q squared. And here, this is z, where z equals just 2 p dot l. So the difference between this and this means that these finite parts are different. And this one is related to impetus, and this one is related to radial action. And obviously, but this way you can get the coefficients of the radial action in terms of impetus, which is what we found also earlier. Right, right. right. But, but th these are two very specific choices that are suggested by thinking about exponentiation or thinking about cancellation of infrared divergences in the EFT when compared to the full theory. But any other random choice generically will give something which uh, it's hard to, to interpret. Maybe, maybe there is a general story, but uh, so far we only understand that there's two nice choices. One is related to impetus, 
the other one is related to the radial action. I cannot see very well. Both integrals are three-dimensional? Yes, both of these integrals are, are three-dimensional. Yeah. So it's crucial that you put the, the full theory in this form and that you choose the right pole to, to read off the finite piece. So this is a linear pole. This is L in the Z direction, whereas this is uh, like the full quadratic uh, three-dimensional propagator. And, and, and it's, it's the EFT that suggests that you should put the amplitude in this form. If you, if you only had the full theory, it would be very hard to, to guess that this is the right thing to do, in my opinion. Maybe for other people, it would be easier. So one of these forms is the form that is written in the paper by Bernetal. That's what. Yeah, in the well, I think it's V was in all of the papers. So one of one of them. No, I mean the original, the, yeah, the yeah. three p.m. Yeah, yeah. So so that was the like even even the paper by Clifford, Michael, and and Ira. They where they did two p.m. They already chose these these y poles, um, and and then they use that again at three p.m. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a there's a trade-off. There's different choices, and I think in the end, what will motivate the choice is what is easier to compute the full theory amplitude, and that's what we did at at 4 p.m. But uh, but if you if you know how to compute the amplitude in the y basis, it has nice properties because it gives you this impetus that you can use to do other things, as as Raphael explained. Do you think about the higher dimensional case because impetus fails? So what happens with the radial action? Well, I I don't see why it would fail. I mean, these arguments That's about semi classical, huh? Exactly right. So it looks very yeah. generic what you did. It's not d dependent, but the cancellation yeah. of divergences is a little tricky in four dimensions versus higher dimensions. I think Paolo was in this paper, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So so how would that go for you, right? Yeah, I, I would think that the radial action can be defined in any dimension. Uh, so there's there's subtleties with the radial action having infrared divergences itself. Uh, so it, that's where problems might, might sneak in. Um, but uh, so something I didn't say is that actually because of this centrifugal piece, I mean, here we are computing some quantity in, in dimensional regularization basically, um, even though I kind of swept that under the rug. Uh, there's a right scheme in which the finite part of the amplitude agrees with the radial action. Like one has to, to regularize the radial action in the right way because for the bound problem, the radial action is, is well defined. But as you know, for the, for the scattering problem, it has some higher divergence. Yes. So that is a non-trivial thing that in higher dimensions might become more tricky or more complicated. Um, yeah, I don't know. But there is no Coulomb tail in higher dimensions, right? It should be actually easier. Yeah, so the, so the phase itself should be infrared, infrared finite. Finite, exactly. Yeah. Um, right. I was I was thinking more about the so so the fact that we had why we had epsilon in the in in our calculation was at, at four pm was because of the tail, uh, and 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 that is a bit uh, subtle. Yeah. So that was not the the Coulomb phase uh, like the Coulomb um, yeah the Coulomb phase. But, but more like the tail divergence. Uh, yeah, but I, I guess what you're talking about at, for higher dimensions, it's even visible at one loop where you see that in addition to the pure like triangle contribution, there's this, there's this box piece. The box, uh, yeah. so for us, even in our calculation, we also have a box like box, cross box uh, like uh, integral that is not zero anymore because we have the yeah. two poles in the same side, but they, you can only close in four dimensions, right? So in higher dimension, it contributes. Yeah. I see. I see. It's very nice. It smells like uh, well, we were used to phase shifts, radial actions, and so on. But it looks like impetus and maybe this first of formula, whatever, is is telling us something about this coefficient, this basis, right? That is special in a sense, right? Because it's not a basis mm -hmm. you would have chosen if you didn't take the classical limit, the first one, right? With the short right, right. Yeah. So I think I think that's true. The the caveat I would say is that it's gonna become harder to put things into this form at higher orders. It's true, computationally uh, speaking, but conceptually, yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. 
there are some kind of charges associated with these guys, right? It's really, it's really weird. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I, I didn't say much about uh, radiation and that kind of stuff, but it, I think it's also very interesting to try to understand how how this KMOC uh, formalism gives gives these things, even even in the conservative case. So something that we did in our recent paper is to use their formulas, but uh, for for the potential region where there's only two particle cuts. Yes. But as it turns out that the the set of two particle cuts because of these numerator insertions where you measure the momentum transfer in some particular place in the exchange, uh, they're slightly different from the usual iconal subtraction. So most of it you can massage into a way that looks like the, the logarithm, but there's still some, some difference which in the end makes up for, for, for the difference between the, like the different versions of the impact parameter like rotated or, or the one in the initial state. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it would be also very interesting to understand that more generally, even in the conservative case where, where these KMOC formulas are very simple because you just have again, an amplitude minus a bunch of two particle cuts, which is what yes. I was saying here. Like the phase is the amplitude minus a bunch of two particle cuts yes. or iterated two particle cuts. The difference is that there, uh, there's these numerators. So what is the role of these numerators is what I, what I like. Well, I like the cuts because those are there to actually have the right boundary conditions, right? From our point of view. So that's what I like mm -hmm. the way uh, they do this. And, and I would like to understand how would they include those, this conservative sector uh, um, when you try to get the tails and the memories and so on. Because you see, there's something funny going on with these tails and memory is that they are, I, are, I mean, in a sense, they're long time. Like if you look at the quadrupole that uh, Justin was talking about in the radiation, right? There's a one over IR pole. There's a one over mm -hmm. epsilon IR. So there's a diversion because it's a long time effect. So does that mean that your your initial state's been asymptotically free? Do you have any issue with that? Because when we do these integrals, we have to assume that there is support, that, that, that they are well-defined, that they have a, a compact support, et cetera. So we, in the fact, is here, we cannot close our eyes because ultimately the conservative part is localized. And we mm -hmm. say, okay, fine, we get the UV divergence, but it cancel with the IR divergence, so we have any of these issues. But how does that show up when you do potential and radiation modes in the KMLC split? So that I don't quite understand yet. But it's interesting because it's very subtle how you get these divergences versus long times and, and short distance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is something that people like Luc Blanchet and also T1, they always complain to us. It's like when you calculate these tails and so on, I mean, this is not compact support. So how would you properly define these things, right? And from the EFT point of view, I don't care. I get a poll. I mean, that poll cancels out, regularize, et cetera. But what am I really doing from the point of view of defining the things uh, um, like asymptotic states, if you're doing an amplitude, say it's like the Coulomb mm -hmm. phase. It's exactly the same problem. You need to subtract it away. So how is that mm -hmm. going to have an issue for you as well? Uh, I, I, I have no idea. Um, uh, may I ask a question, maybe to uh, Rafael? Yes. Can you deal with uh, radiation reaction at three pm with your impetus? You're talking about pn or pm? Pm. Pm. Yes. So we we well, ah, with impetus. Actually, we went a different way. We, um, you could do it with impetus, in fact, and we started doing it, or I started thinking about how to do it with impetus. How would you modify the fact that there is this linear relation, P square is linear, which is what uh, uh, just uh, uh, um, Julio said, this P square M down there. There is an M square now that is modified if you put radiation reaction. And this starts at higher orders, right? So, okay, so you mean the dissipative part, the dissipative part will also start at 3 p.m., yes. Well, but we know there is a, a you know, a feedback into yeah, the yeah, from the amplitude angle from from the radiation reaction. Correct, correct. Which is but not the way... two particle cut. Yes, yes. So but... I wonder if your formalism is well adapted to take care of these things. Yes, but... the correction to the deflection angle. Yes, yeah. but not through impetus. Ah, it's not it's... through impetus. Mm -hmm. No, because impetus is a relation to an amplitude. And remember, I. Once I found my dictionary with the angle, I stopped looking at the amplitude. So I don't use impetus in the sense of connecting the amplitude to the momentum anymore because I can connect the radial action to the angle. And then I, I developed this world line theory in post Minkowskian to compute the angle. Mm -hmm. And I never see the P, the P square anymore. I just go straight to the angle. I see the impulse. I compute from the impulse the angle and from the angle, the radial action. Now you can ask me at this level, can I include the radiation reaction? 
Right. And the answer is yes. If we do the in informalism, the in boundary conditions, the initial uh, value problem, the same way that we did it in post Newtonian. We did exactly the same in post Newtonian to calculate precisely the radiation reaction tail effect. So now we are doing it in the post Minkowskian region. Okay. Uh, and that is almost literally the same calculation. The difference is instead of multiple moments, instead of QIJs, you have T mu nus, essentially. But it's, it's not. It yeah. yeah, it should be equivalent to the to the KMOC calculation that, that we did because it, as we discussed yesterday, it's just a different way of doing in in different choice of of uh, of like the two copies fields that you have to a balls with Brian and the cat. Uh, so I think the doing it that way in the world line should be I, I mean the, the thing is you don't have the S matrix, so you, you think about the evolution directly by doing the path integral, but it should be equivalent and I I would guess there is also a way to write your thing directly in terms of the uh, time order and the time ordered uh, directly, not, not, yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, don't the Feynman rules directly give you that? Like you're using retarded because- No, the Feynman rules give you, give you retarded advance, right? If you look for the conservative part, then it's symmetrized. But otherwise- No, but that is only in one field basis, right? Like you could say the same about schwinger keldish You can use like the plus and the minus or the two copies of the fields. Or you could choose the like the one and the two, the one that you use to evolve the brand, you, the one that you use to evolve the cat. Yes, it's true, but but that has a very has more the, the matrix has an off diagonal term, the, the usual ones, and this other diagonal piece. So you get more terms than in plus minus. Yeah, but that that but that is the that that is the, the that cut, is the cut. Right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So so you do get you do get that that guy, but but it's precisely what what you would expect. Yeah, but from the classical point of view, plus minus is so much more natural, right? Because it's literally x minus goes to zero, x plus goes to x, right? Yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, I agree that it's more natural. But the question is, what is easier to calculate? But I, that's all. I mean, that's my, always my worry. Uh, yeah. So easier that, to uh, calculate is the plus minus. What is hard in the plus minus is because retarded propagators, when you do symmetries of integrals, they go to advance. So all these this symmet fine, fine symmetries of all these light red and all these programs, right? They assume that the propagators are symmetric. So if you do P to minus P, it's the same guy. But it's no longer true when you care about when you're doing dissipation because retarded goes to advance and you pick up a minus sign, which is crucial. So you radiate out and not in, right? So this is what the, these programs have trouble with. And that's why we're having trouble with the sub-boundary conditions as well, because how to implement in all these programs all the symmetries with retarded boundary condition is slightly non-trivial. Mm -hmm. Whereas in your, in your parameterization, if you just use Feynman and cuts, then it all works. However, I thought that computing these cuts was hard. Now you tell me maybe you do reverse unitarity and solve fine. But from what we understand, a three loop doing the cuts is really difficult. So, uh, Well, three loops, yes, it's more difficult. Yeah. No, well, I would say it's as difficult yeah. as doing the integrals. So well, it doesn't can, look like it. So we solve the potentials, for example. We solve the differential equations without post Newton. We have the elliptics, we have the coordinate transformation, and we have the boundary conditions for potential. That is easy, easy. In fact, the boundary conditions were surprisingly easy. But the soft part with actually putting the correct retarded boundary conditions is close because finding the symmetries is really non trivial because we cannot use naively. If we just care about the conservative sector, I, I have decided to stop doing the full thing now and I'm just gonna go for the conservative. And now hopefully we're gonna finish that quickly because I want to do the whole thing. The whole thing is a monster. So mm -hmm. the whole thing will be what Gabriele said, right? I get the full angle, not just the conservative, but also the dissipative part at 4 p.m. Because that's what we have set up to do. We get the full answer. But to get also the dissipative part, it seems to be way too complicated. So I'm now I'm gonna go just for the conservative that looks much easier because then the symmetrization helps you. We can do some tricks and so on. You mean conservative radiation reaction, including conservative, conservative radiation reaction. Exactly. Fixing your ambiguity at 4 p.m. essentially. Mm -hmm. We're gonna kill the pole and fix the, these numbers. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll tell you next week that you can do B2B to that and it works. So we can actually do uh, boundary to band directly with the non-local piece as well. The catch mm -hmm. is the same catch at, catch that Justin mentioned earlier is that if you really want to do, because we're doing it, when you write in your paper, for example, oh, this is a large eccentricity expansion, right? That makes no sense, right? Because there is no large eccentricity expansion for the bound orbit. 
what we said in our paper is that this is a formal way to say the one over j expansion, the coefficient on top is exactly what you get for the uh, bound case. That's the way you should interpret this, right? Mm -hmm. But obviously there is no e to infinity limit only in the scattering problem, right? right? And so in the flags, you see this problem because you will have to go to six loops just to reproduce Newton, which would be crazy, right? The J to the seven. So you need to do first off of the flags, which is what I will show you. Um, but for the tail non-local Hamiltonian, you also can do first off. The problem there is that um, it's a non-local Hamiltonian. So in a sense, we do have the large eccentricity expansion, but we don't want that. We want close to circular. So whether this analytic continuation works exactly the same way is a little trickier. So that's what we are exploring right now. But it fixes the ambiguities and all the local pieces are, are correct. The non-local pieces are just constants that you have to be careful because they, they change a lot between circular and elliptic, right? So if you look at tables, for example, you can write a local Hamiltonian for the non-local term. And this is actually very simple to understand you plug a solution in the thing, and that depends on the initial conditions, so obviously it's local, right? But if the solution changes, then the Hamiltonian that you get is different. And that's what you integrate to get the radial action. So we're trying to extract that Hamiltonian in the large eccentricity parameter and try to say, okay, does that also work when the eccentricity is close to zero? And, and kind of it does, because we actually have some control of the PN expansion, but uh, with, some, with some difficulties. In general, it's non-trivial, right? Mm -hmm. But but for from the point of view of post Minkowskian, like you computed the one over J cube, I can compute the one over J cube as well, and I, I get the periastrum of one over J four now, and and that is in the large eccentric. See if you have a, a very eccentric orbit, this will work. Now for mm -hmm. circular, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. But from that point of view, because the analytic continuation of a local function is easier than the non local function. Let's put it that way. Um, so this is, uh, but you'll see, I, I'll tell you, you'll see the equations and you'll see what I mean. But this is very nice because in a sense, um, it solves this issue that Justin put very nicely, right? We, you cannot even reproduce the quadruple formula of Newton with your answer, right? But the information is there. So you should be able to also read, not just the e to the four over j cube, but all over j seven, sorry, which is the one over j cube, but also the e square and the one because the one mm -hmm. is the one that we actually care about for circular orbits. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to do the same fields of that's that for us for the angle. Like Justin mm -hmm. also said, for the angle, you can do it. So you, you also should be able to do it for the flux. And I'm claiming that you also can do it for the tail. Now, then you can go and compare with numerics and see how well it does, right? That's beyond us, right? But mm -hmm. that's essentially what we can do. And when you guys do the same, uh, when you, Computer radiation reaction, you'll be also producing the final tail Hamiltonian in the large eccentricity expansion. So that will be it. You'll, I, I, I just proved that the non-local part of the radiation reaction works exactly the same way as before. It's actually quite simple. I'm so surprised that I didn't realize this earlier. Everything goes the same way, not just the local pieces, the non-local pieces too. Hmm. So um, at least at least at, two, at two, four p.m. There are corrections that I'm not sure if it's going to work to all orders. That's preliminary. But at 4 p.m. for sure it's going to work. There are some nice symmetries of this tail Hamiltonian. Because you see, um, the, 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 the orbits can be analytically continuing to each other. And then the tail Hamiltonian, you integrate over an orbit. So you can see what the tail Hamiltonian is in one case and in the other. And then you can see if this symmetry that we claim works, like the flux symmetry, also applies to the tail Hamiltonian, and it does. And then you realize why. It's because it has some symmetries. And then you realize that what you compute the radial action, which is the integral of this tail Hamiltonian, if the tail Hamiltonian has symmetries, because we control the endpoints, remember, the R plus and R minus are connected. If the tail Hamiltonian is even in the angular momentum, then it works. The same way that if the flux is even in the angular momentum, this delta E works. And it's mm -hmm. so obvious if you think of, once you control the endpoints, it's so obvious to say like the flux is even in the angular moment. Who cares if you go this way or you go this way? And therefore the integral of the flux between R minus and infinity in the hyperbolic case or between R minus and R plus, and you take this difference, if this function is even, you get the minus sign when you flip the endpoints and you get exactly the connection that you also get to the tail and the flux that he will discuss. So, all I think, these, so what yeah. you're saying is anything that is given by an integral over the trajectory should analytically continue. 
Exactly, exactly. And, and I, because I control the endpoints, if there are some, some nice uh, uh, symmetry properties of this object, like in the scattering angle, is j over a square root of uh, p infinity minus the series g square of r. So that's all under j. And then you get a plus. Mm -hmm. The flag is even, then you get a minus. The tail is even, so you get a minus. So it's so natural. Whatever I think about it, once I control the endpoints, it's so trivial. Now you have mm -hmm. to understand this local expansion in R. Now the non-local tail is non-local, but if you just want to restrict it to an orbit, it becomes local and then you can check and it works. So you're done. What about the Hamiltonian? Because um, now I could ask you, well, when, with first of et cetera, in your paper, you said, okay, from the angle, I can extract the actual Hamilton, the local Hamiltonian, but when you have the, the non-local in time stuff, do you, do you, can you also extract all of that information from- Of course, because from... the Hamiltonian becomes local. It becomes a local function of R, J, et cetera. It has a log. Fine. You mean after, when you integrate over the trajectory, like with, what do you mean, the no, Hamiltonian no, no, you're, itself? You're matching or... the radial action. The radial action is an- No, the radial action is always fine, but, yes. but when I'm, what I'm wondering is the, the actual Hamilton, you have to find a way to write the radial action in terms of the Hamiltonian, which is non-local in time. It's the same with Firso. Firso tells you, you give me the angle, I get the P square, right? P square mm. is, is the local Hamiltonian. The angle is the radial action, right? Mm. Firso now works in a different way. It's much more complicated now. The integral is more difficult, but you can invert. If you give me the radial action or the angle, I can get the Hamiltonian. If you give me the Hamiltonian, I can get the radial action. So it's, it's feels of like inversion. You guess, it gives you, it guesses what the local function has to be for that integral to be the radial action, which is one way in which you can do it. The other way you can do it is the radial action is already, as you said perfectly, action variables. So you can do this Delauni thingy that Tibo likes and that lands in the Hamiltonian right away. Then you undo that to go to R and, and P and then yeah, that's your Hamiltonian. It has a logo bar. I think I think I'll have to wait to your talk to to understand. Well, I'm not going to uh, discuss exactly what you're saying because I only have 45 yeah. minutes. So this will be flashed very quickly. But I'm writing it up, so hopefully it will be out. Yeah. At the same time that we do the 3 p.m. and the 4 p.m. Hopefully. So let's see. Justin, no. about to say something. Yes. Yeah. I mean, are you saying or not that? So this specific question I asked about. Okay. Radiated energy, Newtonian level, there's G cubed, G to the fifth, G to the seventh. Are you yeah. saying or not, you can get the G to the fifth and G to the seventh from some, some way of getting it just from yeah. the G cubed? Yes, you yourself realize this with the angle that you can get once you match to the one over R force, from the chi one three level, yeah. all the R tangent, right? So yeah. what happened there? What happened was there was an integral, you undo the integral, you get the coefficient, and then you do the integral again that you know you can PM expand, yeah. and you play it off. Yeah. You can do the same with the flux. Yeah, but what's, but, okay, I mean, I get, you, you're gonna talk about this next week. But very briefly, because I don't have oh, enough okay. time to cover everything. But we can talk but, about I mean, you know, with the angle, the link was, or, or the, the input was assume the existence of a Hamiltonian or an impetus, whatever, Hamiltonian or but, impetus, with which has a Taylor series in one over R. But the so flux, the EDT, you can always rewrite a function of R, J, and energy. That's a perfectly fine expansion. That's what you are after. You get the coefficients of that expansion of the freaking flux, which is the half the other part that you described. You describe E of omega. Now the flux does exactly the same. Get the flux coefficients, plug it back, and get the higher order term. It's the same, the same, exactly the same thing. But so at, at Newtonian order, the flux has only one power well, of one it, over it, R. Okay, so in that case, you just feed the one over R4. So that's the one that you want to predict. And once you have the one over R4 from Newtonian, you can definitely predict the E to the four the a to the phi and into the seven because the integral will have higher powers of j. Okay. Because you still need to do the integral. Hmm. It's, it's matching. We are matching. If I match the qij, which is an integral way to, obviously I can predict the e4 and the e square. And the information about the qij is in Julio's calculation. So this is 
semi-trivia what I'm saying, right? Okay. Now for the Hamiltonian, for the Ter Hamiltonian, that is non-trivia because that um, I'm assuming, right? That I'm, I'm solving the non-local dynamics over a given orbit and then I make it local, right? Because I'm over an orbit. And that orbit, the one that I can predict from my theory and also Julio will eventually is the large eccentricity case, right? Mm -hmm. So how much can I trust that as truly predicting the, the near circular case for the high eccentricity powers, right? The e to the four, for example, in the flux. Would that guy really be the true analytic expansion? I'm not 100% sure because this well, is- Well, I mean, huh? so it's, you, so it, you, you get this non-local term, uh, this tail term in, in the 4PN, you can, it depends on a trajectory, you evaluate it. So what Demore et al did, they evaluated along a circle. Exactly. No, no, because I don't they, do a circle. Okay, but, you, you can pick either one, pick a circle or a straight line and well, expand about that. Let's say, let's say I do the straight line for the hyperbolic case. Okay, let's say you do the straight line and you expand. And I keep the one over you, J to the, to the lowest order, right? Yeah, well, okay. But you can get some local looking Hamiltonian, like yes, you said. I can predict it from there. I can analytically continue and I predict the radial action in the large J expansion. Right, but you know, the Hamilton, I mean, the, 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 the point I wanna make is, you know, the Hamiltonian itself, you don't have to analytically continue or at least short. No, I'm not short, the Hamiltonian. Yeah, okay. Or, or, well, let's say, I maybe, mean, maybe a way to say it, Justin, if yeah. I understood correctly what he says, any quantity that is given by something which is local function of E, J and R, and it's integrated over the trajectory, every quantity that you can write like that, the integrand, uh, the, the symmetry that Raphael is talking about means that the integrand doesn't depend where, whether you're doing scattering or, or bound. And, yeah. and by, by looking at the, if you can match the integrand, if you understand the structure of the integrand, then you can read off the coefficient from the first order in the expansion and that will predict the higher order coefficients. But you need to understand what it, that you need to assume that that integrand exists and that you understand its structure. Exactly. And then the integral does the job. Exactly. Um, yeah. In the case of the radial action, we know PR. We know PR really well. Yeah. In the case of the flux, we know, the, in the case of the energy, we know the flux, the uh, DT, which we're integrating. So we know well. So in the case of the tail Hamiltonian, it's the tail Hamiltonian, which is the split function. We don't know very well. But if I localize it, it looks like it maps exactly the same way. Now, but that's what I'm saying is that the, the tail contribution to the Hamilton, you localize it near one of these. No, 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 but the straight point, line. Yeah. No, remember, I'm doing, I'm formally mapping the large eccentricity expansion of the Hamiltonian. The same way that, that if you do, if you do the DE match, you do the infinite eccentricity of the bound case, which formally makes no sense, right? But it still predicts the right coefficient of the E to the four. So I'm doing the same with the chair Hamiltonian. Now, whether that is correct, I'm not 100% sure because the split integral is a little bit tricky when you really try to evaluate it in the orbit. Does it really map the e to the four? Does it remain invariant? Because it's not a local function anymore. I suspect it does because I'm doing perturb perturbation theory. So any no local function in perturbation theory is local. Okay, so it has to work. But, but it could be that non-perturbatively, I don't know. It could be that there are some issues. But perturbatively, I strongly suspect this is the same. In other words, uh, Julio's calculation gives you the all velocity e to the four also in the binary case. I can do fields of like to get the e square and the one and the all infinite sum of the e four. I can do exactly the same with the Ter Hamiltonian and I, I will not get the one resum, unfortunately, because I will have to go to J7, which I cannot do. But I will get the one from quadruple formula, that Pn that we know, the E square from Pn, the next order, and the E to the four, I will get resum to all orders. This will be completely useless for LIGO, but it will be a little bit better in approximating the full term Hamiltonian because it will be Pn plus the resum E to the four term, which you can tell me is completely useless and I will agree with you as much as Julio's calculation is probably completely useless, right, for the flux, but it's still true. 
<laughs> no, you said because the e to the four we never measure, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I know what you mean. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm reproducing it, right? I'm saying all these calculations are beautiful, okay? But if you go to the circular case, you give me an eccentricity to the four correction, forget it, right? So, and you're never gonna do the J7. I mean, good luck with that, right? So you have to do something like what I will describe. To ne get never say never, Rafael. <laughs> okay, our lifespan, my lifespan is finite. Maybe you catch up. <laughs> You, you just started, you're motivated. So you can do a six loop calculation one day. And then you can get the quadruple formula. You be. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I'm sure we can do it in n equals eight. Let me say that. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, yes. Anyway, but, but going back to the, to the other thing, I think uh, we need to retool some of the things to do all this. I don't know how you guys did it because just potentials works, right? But for the flags, you had this cut, so these IBPs, these this, uh, symmetries and so on are not that trivial. At least we did not find them that trivial. So I don't know how much you had to retool the things to make it work or not. Because I think here really, if sorry? I can say something about that, um, I really believe this is just a technological problem because all these tools that we have are really built for, let's say, amplitude computation with Feynman propagators. And the only problem we have is that exactly the tools do not consider the type of integrants that we have, let's say with retarded or advanced propagators, which you would like to have. So if anyone would have written these programs, also considering these guys, would be done. I think it would be done. That's now it's just exactly no one has ever done that. So that's where we are stuck. Sorry, but do you have do you have the boundary conditions or you will be done writing the differential equation? What do you mean um, by we, that? I started looking at it and it seems like so I was actually trying to do the same as uh, uh, the NBA, the, sorry, the uh, Carlo, uh, Paolo and people have done to really parameterize them. And at least at two loops, it seems to go through in a very similar way. You can do these parameterizations and you can get the boundary conditions even with uh, retarded and advanced propagators. So at least at two loops, it's doable. Three loops, I haven't looked yet, to be fair. Mm -hmm. So the potential boundary conditions are relatively easy compared to the soft guys. We we understood also from, from uh, um, not much from your paper, Julio, you didn't give many details. But the, this uh, Schwinger parameterization, right? That Carlo uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Gabriel and, and company explain is a little, a little nice because it, it kind of tells you which region you're missing when you do the potentials because you do this large T3 limit, right? That goes into the soft, uh, the soft region because naively we have deltas on the boundary, right? So naively you think you're going to set everything to, to potential. So the, where, where is the hidden radiation, right? So you have to be very careful of what are you dropping because one of the middle guys can go on shell. And if you're not careful, when you do the self expansion of that region, that could be a pole, right? Then you don't get the right answer. But something that happens at, okay, we're not 100% sure, but something that seems to happen at two loop is that all the zeros of the potential become radiation and vice versa. And it seems to be related to the fact that ones are odd and even in the velocity expansion. So you can never mix them, so to speak. Until you hit the tails, you never mix them. Yeah, yeah. Two loops, everything is, is cleanly separated. Exactly, exactly. So this seems to be that the two loop we're almost done with, but the, the three loop, we have the potential, but we are exploring the soft and retarded business, so to speak. And um, so hopefully uh, one day soon we'll figure it out. So, but we need to, I, I mean, I don't know how this works, but we, we need these tools to apply to this retarded business, right? And maybe what you describe is true. Maybe if we rewrite it in a way that we introduce the cuts and Feynman, and then we use the pro, but it looks like we would be doing in a way that is favorable for the programs, but not to us. So we might as well just change the program, <laughs> but uh, we just don't know. I don't know how to do it, obviously, right? And I don't know, Gregor has been exploring this, but just the fact that you have the P0 plus I epsilon square, right? That already screws you, right? Because you, you need relativistic propagators. So you need p squares. Everything is a p square, right? Or a linear propagator, right? Uh, so I wouldn't know how to do it. Um, and also, I mean, I don't know these cuts. Uh, you're saying it's not difficult, right? But we were reading Smirno when he was saying, "Oh, three loop cut integrals are very hard to do." So we say, "Okay, maybe we shouldn't touch these cut integrals, right?" But uh, yeah. Well, he probably also says that three loop integrals are very hard to do. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. 
but it looks at the South region is mostly this problem, not producing the integrand, producing the integral is not a problem. It's really doing this retarded boundary conditions, soft and this symmetries, et cetera. That's what seems to be the obstacle. Uh, but producing the integrand, I think both of us, now we can produce it, right? So the point is just actually doing the integrals. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I guess now with your radial action, with your C poles, you actually get even closer to our integrand. So we probably have very similar uh, integrals now. So that's good, yeah. Mm -hmm. And foresee that we will have a lot of interesting discussions in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. When we'll have all the time to to discuss all this. Issues. Yes, it'd be great to be here. Yeah, go, go, go in Florence, but we 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 we'll handle it. Yeah, we have to do it this way, unfortunately. I, know. <laughs> I was there like in January 2020, the last trip I ever did. Uh -huh. DJI to lecture. Yes, I went there to lecture uh, with Jesse Taylor at the time. And uh, we went out to have the, the steaks and everything it was awesome. So I said, I want to come back. When you guys came out with the workshop, I said, this is great. And now I cannot go. <laughs> so come on. We'll have a second uh, edition, yes, perhaps, in the place in a, in a couple of years. Yes. <laughs> well, a couple of months after we all get vaccinated, we just find an excuse. <laughs> anyway. So is Pierre still there? Yes, I'm still there, yes. What do we do? Shall we? So maybe pretty late, you right? can break for today and, and, and Raphael uh, can compute what he needs to compute and tell us tomorrow what is the answer. Next week. Next week. Okay. Oh, come on. You're the following weeks will get really to the details.